So welcome everybody to Climate Club. My name is Kim Holbury. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a sustainability educator based in Oxford at White and Wood. Um, White is an ancient woodland owned by the university and um, is reportedly the most intensively researched land in the world. Um, the Climate Club is about helping teenagers face the enormity of the sustainable challenge um, in terms of both their practical preparation for the massive changes that are going to take place in their lives, but also in terms of their mental resilience to deal with it. So before Christmas, we held a series of online career discussions for teachers, and this term we are focusing on teachers and how they might incorporate climate and sustainability into their already packed curriculum. Um, so, so far we've done sessions on English and on biology. Um, I think there's probably others I can remember. Um, so coming up we've got one on history um, at the end of term, uh, one on art next week, hopefully one on math and undoubtedly some more from White and Wood. So I feel like we don't really have the answers to this conundrum of how we squeeze these topics into the curriculum, but I feel we're definitely moving the conversation forward. So it's my very great pleasure today to introduce you to one of the researchers at White and Wood. Here he is, Dr. Lumber. Um, I hope you had a chance to look at that lovely video that I put on social media, having linked to the event right. Because it, it is really lovely. And in four minutes, um, I learn something new every time I watch it. Um, so I do recommend it. Um, so Kurt originally trained as a chemist. He spent some time in industry and was an environmental consultant for 20 years. And in, in his own words, he now enjoys combining the inventing of electronic gadgets, sensors and wireless systems with his passion for environmental conservation. So welcome, Kurt, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Um, from the teaching side of the, uh, the debate, I'm delighted to welcome back Martin Steiner. Martin's an environmental science teacher in London, although based in Oxford. He's been immensely helpful to me in a variety of projects, and I'm really grateful for his input. His role today is to consider what Kurt is telling us about the ecology um, at Whiten and to put it in the context of the curriculum, and I know he's done some homework on this. I'll ask Kurt to kick us off with a bit of an update on the work he's doing on the pen, um, and then to Martin to put it into context. So, Kurt, thank you. Thank you. So, the fen, I, I presume that everybody knows what a fen is, but this is not true. I think fens were redefined in the 1960s. Uh, considering fens are 10 or 11,000 years old around the UK, that's pretty recent. And unfortunately, as a result of that, quite a few interesting things have happened. But back to Marley Fen. So Marley Fen is a, a hillside fen on the side of Whiteham Hill. And fens are peat producing wetlands. And they, especially hillside ones, are getting rarer. So in Oxfordshire, because of the geology, we have a large number of, of hillside fens. And each hillside fen is almost unique. They have a un unique ecology. They have a unique history and they have been providing a resource for for us and for wildlife. I know we're wildlife as well, but we're slightly different at the moment for thousands of years, which is absolutely fantastic. The great thing about fens is that, that because they're wet and that, that they have low oxygen, they're, they're pretty good at preserving stuff. So I consider them as a like a res historic archive and some fens are better than others at historic archives. Um, which is fantastic. So Marley Fen was a, a classic case when, where the conservator of White and Woods found me in a digger in at Hill End digging ponds with my colleague uh, Rob Darler, who's another ecologist. And he said, uh, would you like to come over and see my fen? Well, I thought, what an invitation. I thought, well, I'm yeah, going to come over and have a look. So I arrived at this fen and I looked at it and I thought, I mean, it's big. And you wouldn't notice it's there. It's big and it's really unusual. And it, it took me a year to sort of really sort out what exactly is happening with the Fed. So where I come from is <clears throat> a lot of my work uh, as a consultant was sorting out hydrology. Hydrology for buildings, for estates, they could be thousands of acres in size or they can be very small. And in, in some instances, well in one instance involved a, a royal building. Uh, which was occupied at the time, which is quite amusing. So back to the fen itself. Um, yeah, the fen is, is very unusual and it's because it's its setting, it's a hillside fen. 
And so the Fed at the moment, well, what happened about 2010 is that we had a little group uh, with Justin Hughes and uh, Helen Walkingham. Uh, we came together with some MSc students and we formed a little research group to find out more about the Fed and whether or not it was at risk from climate change. So our whole remit was, this is a fantastic piece of habitat. It's survived this long. What could we do now to try and keep it in its current state or allow it to transition to a new state? Don't forget, we can't now stop some of these things transitioning unless you have to intervene each time. So we spent <clears throat> about three years very intensively looking at the hydrology, the hydrochemistry, so the, so the chemicals dissolved in the water. We were looking at where the water was coming from and where it was going to and the routes it was taking. So this is very important. People look at a pond and look just at the pond itself. They forget where the water is coming from. They think it comes from the sky. Well, it does originally come from the sky, but it comes en route from the sky to somewhere. And as it goes en route, it has a new flavor, it has a new taste, and it picks up pollutants and whatever. Jocelyn was looking at the plants. So Jocelyn's interest was the transition between a woodland environment around the fen, which was encroaching on the fen, and the fen itself. And then she was looking at the chemistry of the water and the peat at various points around the fen. Now, the fen is 180 meters long and about 80 meters wide. So it's pretty big. So it's very difficult to do a survey of all the plant species transitioning around such a large area. So she formed, put out a series of quadrats in order to subsample. Uh, it was random, but not random. We had to pick different parts of the habitat, which were obviously different. Otherwise, you don't get subsampling. And then she identified with some, uh, two MSc students who did fantastically uh, all the species that were there. And, um, and I was looking at the hydrology and the hydrochemistry and the geology. And between us, we eventually worked out what was going on with the Fen, what it was, um, what, how it was at a threat from climate change. And actually, it's not, in, in, in the end, it really wasn't climate change that I'm more concerned about. In the short term, it's us. Um, and I came to the conclusion that the trees surrounding the Fen, the natural progression to wet woodland, as in woodland with water within 50 centimetres of the surface, was in, in a sense one of the most immediate threats, followed by two other things. One is the Forestry Commission planted loads of trees, inappropriate ones, at high density in the catchment, so that the rainfall in Oxfordshire, which is already starting to oscillate because of climate change, is going down in summer and probably up in winter, but it's becoming erratic. And that erratic flow of water is terminal to a Fenland and the reason it's terminal to the Fenland is because the water preserves the carbon in the Fen. If you remove the water, you allow oxygen in. And once you've got the oxygen in, the peat decomposes. It releases not only the carbon slowly, like a compost heap, but in that process, it also releases all everything that's locked up. And it allows it to uh, erode. So you then lose the physical structure as well as the peat itself. So essentially, instead of becoming a sink over many thousands of years, it becomes over only a few years. And we have an example in the Lye Valley in Oxford, in the middle of Oxford, where because of the Thames water putting a pipe in, peat was lost from the central channel at a rate of probably in three years, hundreds of tons of peat were, were lost. It was simply eroded away because too much water was essentially passed through the system and it washed away. So Marley Fen, uh, and the last, sorry, there was, yes, there were three factors. The third factor. So Nigel, in, in response to my request, um, uh, went ahead and removed 400 tonnes of, of wood from the catchment and thinned it. And he's going to thin it again, allowing more water to go through the trees because they're no longer conifers. They're much more broad leaves into the ground and then flush through the fen. That's what we need. We need that water going into the ground to recharge the aquifer to go through the fen. And the third threat, which is solely because of us, is from the 
the level of nutrients, especially nitrogen, going into the water supply, going to the fen. And that's being scrubbed out of the atmosphere by the effect of the trees. So it's dry deposit depositing on the trees. We get wet deposition as well in the rain. Unfortunately, in the UK, the more it rains, the more we get this deposition. So some of the most pristine conditions in, in the UK, like parts of the moors and in Wales, we have a lot of rain or more rain than, than we have in Oxfordshire. And because they have more rain, they have more nitrogen coming through the system washed out of the atmosphere. And then all of our woodlands, and we've, there's some fantastic maps on, online from DEFRA, all of our woodlands are, are completely over fertilized. Now, it also happens that the fen is receiving water coming through woodland and it's coming out now in the fen itself. We can see on one edge where the water is coming in a massive growth of plants that really enjoy nitrogen, like cleavers, those plants that sticky weed people call it. Uh, reed is come well, we have reed in any case, but reed loves it. And we get nettles. And this is not a natural state for a fen to have quite so much nitrogen rich water. And one would you know, wonder why. Uh, well, the reason is it grows well. It's great for invertebrates. And if you're going to grow, if you want to uh, graze it with cattle, which is what it used to be, uh, used to be grazed. And then before that was grazed by those large things called aurochs or aurochs or whatever they are. Um, then the nitrogen causes a plethora of one or two species to grow really well and they outcompete. And we've had this on our grasslands as well. They outcompete all of the other diversity, the plant diversity. And that plant diversity takes <clears throat> years to change. So you are talking about for a meadow, if you stop manuring it and, and treating it um, like a, a pasture, it will take more than 10 years to go down to a, a lower nutrient state. And a lot of our soils, which are hundreds of thousands of years old, that process may take 50 to 100 years. So, and that does not, is not helped by the fact that we have nitrogen raining down in the atmosphere. And to put into context as a number, it's about 15, or that might've changed, 15 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And that's coming from Northern Europe, including us, from the combustion of fossil fuels. It's slightly reduced now because we have catalytic converters, but that's a little bit of a sticking plaster because you have to use rare earth to go and make these catalytic converters. So we have our pleasure, but we have left a legacy and the legacy is still there. And it's very difficult to stop the production of nitrogen oxides from the burning process because we need that energy. So again, that's another direct consequence. And don't forget that that nitrogen rich rainwater also affects things like mosses, lichens, and all of those things that survive on atmospheric precipitation. And it not just doesn't stay in Northern Europe, it starts to spread. And in a few years ago, we had a, a real scare about acid rain, which was the sulfur dioxide equivalent of the nitrogen oxides. And that was much more visible. You could see the London smogs and they were terrible. Now we have an invisible uh, pollutant, nitrogen oxides. They're not really invisible. They're actually slightly hazy brown. So if you fly into some um, far eastern um, cities uh, because they have two stroke engines, you, you go through this brown haze on the horizon uh, and it's not very pleasant. When you get out, you can smell it. And it is very, very, very obvious. So yes, yeah, so Marty Fan has those three immediate problems is the increase in nutrients coming from the atmosphere scrubbed out by the, the, the woodland, the growing and canopy closing woodland, which on the short term is starving the fen of water and its throughput. And that's making, it's, it's meaning there's less water through, so there's less dilution of the rainwater. And the third one was the encroaching woodland, which normally would be kept back by us or by grazing animals using the fen, which requires a bit of poaching. There's no question of leaving it alone, the fen loves to be poached and damaged a bit and then left alone and then damaged again and left alone. So usually with fens, we have a, a mechanical sheep and it's us with a mower and we have to cut and scrape everything off so that that top thatch is removed. And that's a short term. What I found over the past 10 years is that the fen, when it's starved of water, doesn't let anything out. So although there's no water going in or very little 
during a really dry summer and we've had three or four in the past past uh, 10 years or so really really dry summers that's so fantastic for research it's not good for the fen but it's fantastic for research is that that fen stops releasing water and it's like a big sponge that eventually stops you know it does stops dribbling but it still is full of water so it's kept it but unfortunately because you have a little bit of gravity pull on there the top surface which normally is wet within 15 centimeters or so and that's the definition of the fen that was imposed in the 1960s because that level now is half a meter down or more you're getting a lot more oxidation of the lower peat and on an area that size you're getting quite a lot of loss of co2 and the thing about fens is that the it's not the over it's not the the, the, the sort of the vegetation on the surface that's doing the um is sequestering the, the, the carbon it's the roots of the plants that are growing in the fen they're the ones that get preserved by the low oxygen content and if you look at some of these plants they're fantastically adapted to growing in low oxygen conditions so they have sort of channels through the roots and they're hollow so see things like the giant horsetails equisite and uh, tomatea fantastic and you can see if you chop if you look into the, uh, the sort of chop little bit of a hole near the root you can see the change in chemistry as the oxygen diffuses down those tubes and then changes the chemistry either side of, of the root so there we are so the fen at the moment i've left it i i did a lot of uh, work on it in order to measure the chemistry the woodland's been chopped down uh, or thinned higher up and then the surround's been removed the fen is recovering it's it's the biodiversity has, has rocketed and we're also cutting every year cutting the reed back every year to let the thatch grow back again and then we get some new seedlings so the number of plants are going up the most unusual bees soldier flies grow in, in um, breed in this fen as well uh, they like um, two for de deposition and we can explain this in, in the discussion so it's all very good and the initial results so I hate always saying this, but the initial results are when I've been there with, with groups of students, there's one or two boreholes uh, that I've put in that I can sample the water. The nitrogen content in that water going into the fen has dropped dramatically to what I would consider background Oxfordshire levels, which are never, never zero. So I'm really, really pleased. And in a couple of years time, I will start another year of, of, um, of analyzing the water. It takes a, quite a lot of effort and, and to see what's happened after we've intervened in the fen so there we are so there's a, a very uh, concise uh, summary of what the i've been up to with the fen and i can see that lots of pens have been scribbling taking some notes fantastic right questions thanks uh, gosh i've got so many questions but i'm going to hand over to martin who i think has um, perhaps got uh, some thoughts Hi, yeah. Yeah, I, I was indeed scribbling all kinds of things <laughs> during that. Um, and I see loads of different, um, you know, things there which feel very relevant to me in my teaching. I, um, I was trying to think about, like, what would I actually do with this? Um, I think you you had three things, so I might have three things as well about, like, what to do. And the first of those would be about just kind of taking our kids to some Finland and kind of looking at it and you know making some kind of measurements and things of their own um it was interesting i mean when nigel spoke to us a couple of weeks ago he was really emphasizing that you know it's really important to get kids kind of knowing their local nature and sort of having a, a feel for it so like um if we were to do that i can i can see some things that i think like we might be able to measure i can see that perhaps we can go and we can look at um you know the sort of species composition i don't know it would be really interesting to hear from you about you know the extent to which you think kids would be able to kind of get sensible data like if we went and we measured nitrate levels in some way would we get meaningful data um if we um put out some quadrats would that be horrendously like harmful for us to be wandering all over a fen um yeah, so, so it would be interesting to, to hear from you about your thoughts about like, what could we replicate with kids and get interesting data around. Okay, uh, you've given me two, two, two ideas. Anything else that struck you as you might wish to do? You've got any other? It's, you, you've put two, you've, put, um, you've said nitrate and quadrats. 
Yeah, it's... I thought the horse tails was quite interesting. Yeah. Um, the idea of cutting into them, and I worried yeah. about um, whether that was an acceptable thing to do. Um, some kind of mapping exercise. Yeah. Um, we have a thing about sort of land use change. Yeah. Um, I mean, that would be secondary data, really, but it'd be interesting to... Yeah. Um, okay, I've got two, two things for that for you. Yeah. So, All Martin, right. can, I, can I clarify? So you're talking about the biology A-level curriculum, though, is that right? Uh, the land use changes GCSE um, oh, yeah. biology. Um, I suppose the species composition stuff is a bit more A level. Um, yeah, and then I mean the nitrate stuff really interests me from the sort of like IB environmental science kind of um, side of things. Right. Okay. I can answer all of your questions and give right. you some material that you could do in the fen. Uh, first of all, fens like disturbance. So what we discovered when the MSc students uh, were going there, they were going there much more frequently. Well, I was going there every two weeks and they were going there every week to do their work, is that we had to we had to develop paths because each path increased the biodiversity. So as far as I'm concerned, if I can take 20 or 30 students and tear through the fen, I'm quite happy with that because what they're doing is they're like being a large 400 kilo animal doing some, some poaching. That's not a problem. So yeah, and and in a sense less less destructive. I mean, we go along there with a with a with a sort of like a forage harder cutter and just chop everything down, um, which is a very samey. So actually, kids going in, doing some damage, making their own piles is great. Um, one thing I would suggest with that one is that they actually have some gloves on because some of the the sedge is very sharp. And if you're low down or you've got soft skin, it's okay, people like me, but even I get cut. And the other thing is that some of the reed has got, it's, it's very difficult to see edge on. So it's always good to have a bit of safety glasses. Then they can just hammer in and don't worry about it. Yeah. So the two things that I always, you know, concerned, oh, there's the third one is that some of the plants, if you brush them, will, will give you sap that you might be allergic to, especially if you're exposed to light. And they're easy to avoid, but those are the three things that I normally I warn people about. The other things would be you might get bitten by the odd, you know, fly. Who cares? As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's good practice. And there are some metals in there. Um, again, as far as, as children are concerned, I think they should be able to identify a nettle and stay away from it. So the quicker they learn, the better. OK, nitrate tests. Right. Um, you, you, they're really easy to do. And there are already boreholes there, so, so you know where they are. And you've got a bottle and in a string, you can take some water. If you're lucky, there's some water down there. The last time I've been there, the water was so dry, there wasn't any. Um, but there is usually water somewhere on the fen, or you, you can make a small depression and there'll be water in there. Um, you can buy aquarium tests. That's one. I, I had them upstairs, but there you can buy simple aquarium tests where you put a few drops in. Fantastic. And the other one is, and they have, so those are much less accurate in the sense that they do a high concentration so in parts of the fen those will, would be appropriate you would have high enough concentration and also drinking water would do the same thing so oxygen to drink water has got loads of nitrate in it it won't affect you it's no good for your pond but you can demonstrate very easily just with normal tap water um, so you can do that with nitrogen and phosphorus so you can get a phosphate one as well and you could also get an ammonium one don't call it ammonia although they call it ammonia it's not it's, it's ammonium Ammonia, they'd be coughing, ex you know, coughing with the gas. Um, and from the Freshwater Habitats Trust, they may, if you if you if you ask them very kindly, they have special uh, nitrate testing of at, at a lower level, and they've got I think they come in packs of five, and they want samples to be taken around Oxfordshire, as around the country, and they may have some more packs. So if you know Pascal um, at the Freshwater Habitats, so Freshwater Habitats Trust contact them, ask them, say it's Kurt says, have you got any of your lovely nitrate testers available? Please can we have some kits for X number of, of children? Yeah, fantastic. Easy, good win. Okay, the next one, and you can follow it through. So you can you can follow it with, so you can link that into nettles, sticky weed, which they'll easily be able to, to identify. So this is the vegetation part. Uh, nettle, sticky weed, um, and you can probably pick on something else, like maybe bracken or bluebells, which depends on when you arrive, you can see bracken normally. 
Um, quadrat, yeah. I mean, actually, easier than a quadrat would be a transect because then you can do transitioning from essentially a sandy bar, knowing the geology, and there's loads of geology. Uh, I've got lots of geology and maps and things that you, that you use. Um, I had an artist who got submerged in gigabytes of information from me, and then she produced this fantastic art exhibit. So there's a lot of visual material about the fen which you can use. And there's a there's a sandy bar at one side, which is where the aquifer is, and it's got a, it's not it's unbuffered, so there's there's less calcium in there, and we have bluebells on there, and a bit of dog's mercury. Dog's mercury doesn't like the acid, but the bluebells love it, and that transitions almost straight into the fen, which is really strange. So we have bracken and bluebells together, bracken being acidic as well, and then we have reed, and it's like within two meters, there's this sudden change from one to the other. We also have fantastically rare plants there in a few orchids, so and you might even spot those. But definitely a transect, and you can do one down the fen, and you can do one across the fen. Love it, because if you go down the fen, you'll get woodland and some lovely bryophytes, and then some mosses and sedges, and then uh, uh, sort of mosses and re uh, reed. And then as you go down, you get the sedges, and then you go back onto the dry again. And the water quality changes. At the same time, depending on, you can have another group, uh, you can follow and map um, the greater and lesser pond sedge. And it's great because the greater pond sedge is darker green and loves the, the nitrogen and only appears round really where the nitrogen comes out in the springs. And then it sort of travels down in a band. And then the lesser pond sedge, which likes it cleaner and it's slightly dry on either side. They're both very easy to identify with the little angle and they can always have a go, but their eyes are so good, they could probably pick up the change in green. So the lesser and, and, and greater pond sedge, fantastic. It's there all year, so it's really easy. And if you plot that, you're essentially plotting the flow of nitrogen and water through the system. So those two really easy things for you to do. Um, roots, yes, do by all means that there's some fantastically, uh, I've got photographs of me being buried in these equisetum this tall um yeah really good i mean even better if you can burn some of the some of the leaves somewhere you can see the silicon in there and then look at it under a magnifying glass fantastic because it's got lots of silica in it so horsetails always grow where there's lots of silica especially ones that are aquatic so the sand aquifer equals horsetail i guarantee wherever you see horsetails like that giant horsetails is coming out of the sand aquifer or there's some there's there's silica in in the water fantastic so yeah, if you dig up, you don't have to do very much. You can simply put a spade down, separate it, and then you can see, take out a sod, examine it and shove it back in again. No, nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of fen there and there's a lot of mud. And at the same time, you could probably look at the tufa. The so tufa is the calcium carbonate, essentially carbon dioxide degassing. So let me start again. Soils don't have air in them only. They have a lot more carbon dioxide. People forget that the carbon dioxide, the soil is mostly a lot, a lot of carbon dioxide. And that's the bit that's being decomposed and then goes to the atmosphere. So what happens is if you've got a nice working woodland, the soils have got a lot of turnover. You've got this lots of carbon dioxide. And as the water goes through, it picks up the carbonic acid. And because we've got limestone, it dissolves the limestone, makes you calcium bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate, don't care what you call it. And that is much more soluble, comes through the system. And as it comes out, it degasses, all the CO2 boils off, and you get this surface covered. Everything is preserved, beautifully covered. You get these pieces of twig that are just stone. And if you chop them in half, you can then see the, the, the rings and the layers of all the carbonate, the calcium carbonate that's been deposited on it. And those are the areas where you get the stone flies. And we've got quite a few beautiful springs around there, but they've got layers of this. And it goes back right down to about three and a half, four meters. And you can see layers of this where you've got a, a silt, and then you've got the, the, the two for deposition as, as everything moved around and the springs moved. Oh, yes, the springs move a lot. So we've had this. We had something drive on there, which you shouldn't have done. And the spring moved and a big old tree, oak tree, 250, 280 years old, died in a year because all of a sudden its water supply was <coughs> cut off. So fantastic. Yeah, tufa, easy. You can map that as well. And they can stick their finger in and, and look around and you can see it. And you can see what things have been deposited there. So you can bring in the carbonate and its, its things. Um, so there's at least two or three map mapping exercises for you. Have I missed anything off? You're going to be up there for a week, Martin. I think. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming to the end of this session. Um, I'm, I'm, t I'm tempted to go on for a slightly longer. Um, 
As long as you want. It. Yeah, Martin, have you got another question that you wanted to put? If anybody's got anything they want to ask, just stick it in the chat. Um, I was I was going to follow up a little bit on um, the sort of secondary data point and thinking about um, that, you know, I mean, one of the things that our kids have to do is learn to kind of analyse data. And it would be lovely if the data that they were analysing was of a place that they know. So I guess sort of um, how would we go about getting hold of data like that what would be useful and accessible to um children i mean we can look at primary literature but yeah uh in terms of marley fen or just fens in general well i mean i suppose i mean i guess not everybody who is here now or will listen to this later is in oxford so it might be a local fen to them but um yeah i mean i i guess Marley Fen has been very well studied and I can, it, has, yeah. but it would be really interesting to yes. have access to sort of professional good quality data yes. to do some data analysis on. Well I can give you some real data I don't know whether it's professional or good quality um, so yes yeah, so I'm the custodian and the owner of all the water quality and the water level data so we have essentially 3D maps of the of the water and then we've got points of the boreholes so you're more than welcome to use that data and plot it and they can even plot it in 3D. Um, you could even, if you really want to be advanced, you can go to QGIS and, and do it in that, but that might be too much. But they can easily plot it on some graph paper or something like that, produce a surface. And then we've got the water quality data. I have data for other sites and rivers as well. That's probably too much, but definitely for the fen. And for the plants, um, if you ask Justin Hughes, and she is the custodian of the plant data, uh, I'm sure that she will give you a, a snapshot although i have the data i'm i must ask my colleague first before it's always released but i'm sure if you ask her she will have more than happily actually give you you know the primary data that you can actually then then analyze and and that's you know there's quadrant data and she has done some transects as well so that would also help you with if you go there with identifying the plants because then you actually get a plant list it's a lot easier than looking through rows where you've got thousands of plants and you have you know a great plant list um yes no problem we've got data on that uh, there's a lot of data on fens in generally and what you could do is things like the fen handbook uh, that's probably too advanced but it, i suppose if you do a bit of a search you will find some more generic stuff about the area of fen areas of fen in the uk and of course norfolk broads have fens uh, so you'll find things online and if you also look up judy webb you might find some simpler explanations so judy is also one of my colleagues um and she's so judy and i are, are essentially fen specialist in the U in, in Oxfordshire and um, and uh, yeah so and she has written a f quite a few things which are online uh, which describe fens and how they operate and from a much less of a scientific point of view but actually from a management point of view from an interest and a public point of view because she does a lot of public engagement for that so yes you can have the data you have my data I think that that whole data question raises a point that lots of teachers keep coming keep asking about it's like they're, they're really interested in getting getting data for their students to do projects with and things and um although people always say oh yes it's available it's very difficult i think for teachers with very limited time and, and those not specialist knowledge to even begin to know where to look you know how to you know if you get a bunch of data what are you supposed to do with it you know, it's, it's tricky. I think it's a real sort of gap that we could perhaps help fill at some point between the researchers. Because it's so lovely to enthuse young people about what you guys are doing. And if we could just ease that connection, that data connection somehow, uh, I think we could do a lot of good. So something to think about for us at working for me. So, Martin, when you do ask, also ask for the weather data, which I have. I'm the custodian of most of the weather data in Whiteham. Uh, it goes along with the uh, with the hydrological data, so you get the two. So you can see rainfall versus hydrology. So hopefully, I've got I have, I've covered most of the gaps in in terms of the weather data. So because this is real data, there are gaps. But that's also a good teaching exercise because it's real real data. It has gaps in. Yeah, that's a great great project. I think uh, that could be done with all that all that data. It's very interesting. Um, Katrina asked a question about the um, biodiversity. Did you introduce plants to increase biodiversity or did it re regenerate naturally? Ah, right. Good question. Do you introduce or do you or do you let it regenerate naturally? 
we have habitat fragmentation in the UK, which is second to none on the planet. So therefore things don't move from one place to another. So although seeds sometimes are long lived, they have a half life. And if you think of the half life of even if it's five or 10 years, very few seeds are left that will be viable of the original plants that were there. And because there's now no free roaming large animals, except for us and our boots, which are actually not so good, there, there isn't really a transfer of, of plant species from one fen habitat to another. So I have to be very careful because we have things like uh, Crassula, which sometimes if I've gone to a pond for my consultancy and, I'm, and, and it's got Crassula, I have to essentially clean my wellies so they're completely clean before I go to another site. So I can inadvertently introduce plant species that shouldn't be there. And that actually has happened in Wyatton. You see a lot of researchers pulling up onion species and balsam and all sorts of things as we see it, we pull it up, but it comes on tires and everything. Uh, introductions, there are some. So at the moment in Oxfordshire, uh, there's a, 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 an interesting, uh, it's sort of a research, but it's not research. One of the plants that we've lost is the marsh um, lousewort. And marsh lousewort has a fantastic history. It is semi-parasitic on things like reed. So it would have been in the fens which were regularly grazed and it, it sort of it feeds off the roots of the reed and it makes the, the, the reed grow less, which means if you introduce it back into a fen, in, in Oxfordshire we always had it, but it's died out, then the reed doesn't grow as much, which means that we don't have to cut as much. And it's a natural part of, of a reed's sort of maintenance. Now that is being introduced in certain fens in Oxfordshire, and the Lye Valley is one example, with permission of, of Natural England, because each one's isolated, we can do it. And it's worked fantastically. It has kept the reed under control, and the biodiversity around that has suddenly escalated because it is not only nectar producing, it has its own uh, invertebrate structure that goes with that plant. And then other plants benefit from that plant's activity. So marsh lousewort is not alone. You have hay rattle, which does the same thing. Uh, red bartsia does the same thing. So these plants are hemiparasites that, that exist in a lot of the meadows around Oxfordshire, and they do a fantastic job of keeping the grass down. Um, so that's, yeah. So the answer is yes, introduction, but only if either there's a, a population that's been there before or to save a population. So we're doing that now in Oxfordshire with the fen violet, which really likes wild rivers. We don't have any wild rivers. So the fen violet project is doing that. Um, but we do not introduce things like typha. So greater reed mace, the thing with the, the, the bulrush thing, which is not really bulrush, bulrush is slightly different. Um, we don't introduce things like that, uh, especially if you dig a new pond you do not put anything in it. So in ponds, we do not seed ponds. So when I've created ponds, you do not seed them. And the reason you don't create, you don't have to seed them is that most of the wildlife will either walk there or fly there. Don't forget that some of these, these insects fly there. And when they do fly there, they bring what they need, what they, what they need, well, they bring the plants with them. If you introduce something, if you come go over there and take some from the from the Thames and dump it in your pond, you will get some hor horrible thing. So the answer is sometimes yes, very carefully. Generally no, frowned upon. Allow it to do its own thing. Two approaches. That's fantastic. Um, I fear we've run out of time to talk about mice, which is terrible. I, th I think we'll have to come back and talk about mice. Can we ask you to do that at another time? <laughs> Less of a climate change issue, mice, as far as at the moment, but we don't know really. But yeah, I know they don't want to get climate. Just They're nice. very cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much to to Kurt and to Martin uh, for a very interesting discussion. I, I hope everyone found a nugget or two of, of useful information or inspiration from what you've said. Um, so thank you. Next week we are looking at art, as I said, and how we can engage students in the natural world through their own artwork. Um, so look out for that on social media and on Eventbrite. Um, thanks again to our guests and to you for joining. Keep safe, uh, those of you who are in schools as they open up. Um, have a lovely evening and that's uh, goodbye from Climate Club for today. Bye. <laughs>